Hello, everybody, wherever you are. And thank you, Simon, for introducing us so graciously and putting the whole thing in context. It's my pleasure to begin by introducing my team of readers, a truly international team consisting, first of all, of Andreas Ammon, speaking from Dresden this evening, where he lives, who trained first as a stonemason and later as a specialist historic buildings architect. Then Nick Boys, speaking from Edinburgh, consultant, stone and lime specialist, trained in fine arts originally, then later in stonemasonry and later as a conservator. James Fowley, speaking from Dublin, architect, well known for his Millennium Bridge in Dublin and for his wide ranging work with historic buildings of all kinds and his special love for gardens. I cherish my copy of his book, Follies and Garden Buildings of Ireland. Rory Young, speaking from Sirencester, who often refers to himself as an artificer, lovely word, very special word, very special man, sculptor, letter cutter, inspiring teacher. He and I once went on mission to Thailand together and it was amazing to see the response to Rory's teaching. As a sculptor, he is revered for his skillful reimagining of the Great West Doorway of York Minster, and also for his more recent seven powerful polychromed con stone sculptures of modern martyrs in the Cathedral and Abbey Church of St Alban. I am based in Falkland, a beautiful village in Fife, north of Edinburgh. I'm an architectural historian with many years of professional involvement with churches, cathedrals, country houses and historic towns. Philip Webb, proto-architect of the arts and crafts movement and his influence on younger architects has been the chief topic of my research for many years. To put our readings in context, it is impossible to think of Ruskin and architecture without recognizing his profound influence on the arts and crafts movement, which in turn can be seen as a direct descendant of the Gothic revival the Gothic Revival's most influential practitioner was Augustus Northmore Welby Pugin, whose short life ended in 1852. While John Ruskin, born in 1819, dying in 1900, was its chief and most powerful polemicist. Today, many of us may regret that Ruskin was so opposed to the classical style of building and architecture and sculpture and could speak of the foul torrent of the Renaissance. After all, classical buildings were also built by highly competent and frequently inspired craftspeople. But Ruskin also introduced the immensely powerful contention that good Gothic art flowed from the independence and motivation of the craftspeople who created it Ruskin believed that that was the secret or specialness of Gothic art. William Morris, who enrolled as a student at Exeter College, Oxford in 1853, there, together with his close friend Edward Burne Jones, discovered, devoured and pondered the writings of Ruskin, even as they were, in the case of the Stones of Venice, being published. <laughs> Ruskin's influence was critical, I believe, in turning Morris's formidable energies towards two Ruskinian areas for dynamic action. The promotion and preservation of the beautiful in art and architecture, and a determination to make human lives better through courageous and articulate activism in the arts, crafts and social politics. We will read passages from John Ruskin's Lamp of Memory in The Seven Lamps of Architecture, but first we will read from the long essay on the nature of Gothic, chapter six of the second book of Ruskin's trilogy, The Stones of Venice, published in 1853. Morris so respected this chapter 
but he published it as a separate volume at his Kelmscott Press in 1892. To that volume, he contributed a preface in which he says that in future days, it will be considered as one of the very few necessary and inevitable utterances of the century. And then in a remarkable paragraph, he explains why. For the, for the lesson which Ruskin here teaches us is that art is the expression of man's pleasure in labor, that it is possible for man to rejoice in his work. For strange as it may seem to us today, there have been times when he did rejoice in it. And lastly, that unless man's work once again becomes a pleasure to him, the token of which change of which change will be that beauty is once again a natural and necessary accompaniment of productive labor, all but the worthless must toil in pain, so that the result of the thousands of years of man's effort on the earth must be general unhappiness and universal degradation, the conscious burden of which will grow in proportion to the growth of man's intelligence, knowledge and power over material nature. The key phrase, and the one most frequently quoted, is that art is the expression of man's pleasure in labour. We will shortly begin the readings from Ruskin's chapter on the nature of Gothic. At its best, Ruskin's prose has a directness and vividness which makes it memorable and meaningful. But at times, there is a teasing ambiguity which requires us all to try to discover what he means or to what he is referring. And hence, I believe, the joy of reading Ruskin together. I should explain our reason for focusing on the nature of Gothic. It is because now, in our time of IT and AI, we urgently need to have a fresh debate about what constitutes meaningful work what sort of freedoms we need to allow us to be creative and how we ought to be rewarded so that we can enjoy both our work and our leisure and so that we can be satisfied by what we are doing and know that it is value, both for ourselves and for society in general and for our own particular communities. And this is what we have to do with all our laborers, to look for the thoughtful part of them and get that out of them, whatever we lose for it, whatever faults and errors we are obliged, obliged to, to take with it. For the best that is in them cannot manifest itself, but in company with much error. Understand this clearly. You can teach a man to draw a straight line and to cut one, to strike a curved line and to carve it, and to copy and carve any number of given lines or forms with admirable speed and perfect precision, and you find his work perfect of his kind. But if you ask him to think about any of those forms, to consider if he cannot find any better in his own head, he stops. His execution becomes hesitating. He thinks, and ten to one he thinks wrong, and ten to one he makes a mistake in the first touch he gives to his work, as a thinking being. But you have made a man of him for all that. He was only a machine before, an animated tool. And observe, you are put to stern choice in this matter. You must either make a tool of the creature or a man of him. You cannot make both. Men were not intended to work with the accuracy of tools, to be precise and perfect in all their actions. If you will have that precision out of them and make their fingers measure degrees like cogwheels and their arms strike curves like compasses, you must unhumanize them. All the energy of their spirits must be given to make cogs and compasses of themselves. All their attention and strength must go to the accomplishment of the mean act. The eye of the soul must be bent upon the finger point and the soul's force must fill all the invisible nerves that guide it 10 hours a day. And that it may not err from its steely precision and so soul and sight be worn away and the whole human being be lost at last. A heap of sawdust. 
so far as its intellectual work in this world is concerned, saved only by its heart, which cannot go into the forms of cogs and compasses, but expands after the 10 hours are over into fireside humanity. On the other hand, if you will make a man of the working creature, you cannot make a tool. Let him begin to imagine, to think, to try to do anything worth doing. And the engine turned precision is lost at once. Out come all his roughness, all his dullness, all his incapability, shame upon shame, failure upon failure, pause after pause. But out comes the whole majesty of him also. And we know the height of it only when we see the clouds settling upon him. And whether the clouds be bright or dark, there will be transfiguration behind and within them. We have much studied and much perfected of late the great civilized invention of the division of labor. Only we give it a false name. It is not, truly speaking, the labor that is divided, but the men. Divided into mere segments of men, broken into small fragments and crumbs of life, so, so, so that all the little piece of intelligence that is left in a man is not enough to make a pin or a nail, but exhausts itself in making the point of a pin or the head of a nail. Now it is a good and desirable thing, truly, to make many pins in a day, but if we could only see with what crystal sand their points were polished, sand of human soul, much to be magnified before it can be discerned for what it is, we should think there would be some loss in it also. And the great cry that rises from all our manufacturing cities, louder than their furnace blast, is all indeed for this that we manufacture everything there except men. We blanch cotton and strengthen steel and refine sugar and shape pottery. But to brighten, to strengthen, to refine, or to form a single living spirit never enters into our estimate of advantages. And all the evil to which that cry is urging our myriads can be met only in one way not by teaching nor preaching, for to teach them is but to show them their misery, and to preach to them, if we do nothing more but preach, is to mock at it. It can be met only by a right understanding on the part of all classes of what kinds of labour are good for men, raising them and making them happy, by a determined sacrifice of such convenience or beauty or cheapness as is to be got only by the degradation of the workman and by equally determined demand for the products and results of healthy and ennobling labor. And how, it will be asked, are these products to be recognized and this demand to be regulated? Easily by the observance of three broad and simple rules. One, never encourage the manufacturer of any article not absolutely necessary in the production of which invention has no share. Two, never demand an exact finish for its own sake, but only for some practical or noble end. Three, never encourage imitation or copying of any kind, except for the sake of preserving records of great works. Thank you. I thought we might just pause for a moment and see what collectively or individually we feel about those three broad and simple rules. Andreas, have you any comments? Yes, I think we are quite away from this because we are producing in general such a incredible mass of copies of um, unnecessary things and there's such a little amount of repair but hopefully there is a new direction to repair cafes and to use of uh, um, second-hand things mm. yes Rory what are you thinking 
Well, I agree with that. Um, however, art has been copied right through the centuries. Interesting about antiquity. Now, did Ruskin look, he didn't like classical, but did he like antique classical? And, um, you know, it's a myth. It's a romantic myth. It's a soft idea, sentimental idea that uh, you find the figure in the stone. It's a layman's idea. In fact, stone uh, was very carefully mapped out from models right from the start, and it was oft copied uh, from bronze into stone by the Greeks and then the Romans. And I think just because there wasn't room on sites to keep models, but I'm sure that right through the medieval period, there must have been a system of model making. You couldn't just hack into a piece of stone and expect it to fit the niche. There must have been a lot of pre-measuring and that, that interests me, that Ruskin didn't take in, into account all that. And as you say, he, he missed, he had blank spots. We all have blank spots. And interesting you said about color, that he, he just, just didn't think about polygamy. So. Thank you, brilliant comments. So James, I bet you have something to say. Well, I suppose mainly just about things being made that aren't necessary. I mean, yes. when you see the amount of rubbish and poorly made, cheaply produced that just falls to pieces. Um, I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I'm sad. I mean, some of my favorite things are old tools, old, old objects, an old coffee grinder that was antique when I bought it 40 years ago and still serves. You know, those are the things that just give, you know, great pleasure, you know, to use them. Never demand an exact finish for its own sake. Absolutely correct. There is too much self-conscious effort um, in an appearance that's, that's detached from tradition. So we need to look at the evidence. We need to look at um, the buildings that we're working on and where there is a tool surface, for example, then there is an honorable tradition of copying that tool surface for authenticity. Sure. Well, I'm very conscious that these thoughts are arising in us as we're reading, and it would be wonderful if we could stop after every paragraph, but then we'd be here for 24 hours. So we'll go on, but thank you all very much for those spontaneous comments. We can imagine these broad and simple rules commending themselves to William Morris. Morris was a designer of great skill, an artificer like Rory. He made things beautiful and exceptional things with his own hands and encouraged and enabled others to do so. He had Im Im imagination, which is probably a good synonym here with the word invention, which Ruskin uses. And I, I caught that, that the end of the third rule perhaps refers to Ruskin's passion for commissioning young artists to copy works of art, especially in Italy. <laughs> which Ruskin feared might disappear on account of revolution, ignorance or neglect. And we're showing a watercolor of a painting recorded for Ruskin by the young Charles Fairfax Murray, uh, and uh, now and still in the collection of the Guild of St George in Sheffield. For a comparable use of the key word imagination, we may turn to William Richard Letheby's Philip Webb and his work. Oxford University Press, 1935. Quote, where work is sound, competent and natural, there will necessarily be a leaven of invention keeping it sweet. An architect is properly an experimenter, developer, adapter, an inventor in building, not a supplier by rote of tried and stale grandeurs in the styles. James, do you want to say anything about the image which is on the screen at the moment? And well, they, they, this is a lovely church. Um, we were very fortunate to have the chance to restore after a bad fire. And it was designed by J.J. McCarthy, who was a, a pupil of, well, a, a pupil and follower of Pugin. And the entire, all of this wonderful stone, all the arches, the entire chancel, uh, everything had been painted. I actually thought all these beautiful carvings were plaster. Uh, but in fact, they are um, Gothic revival carvings, the angels um, holding the roof trusses. 
The lower heads were all done by wonderful Irish arts and crafts sculptors um, just after independence. And the work, um, we managed to um, remove all this paint, reveal this wonderful uh, um, bath stone, and we redesigned the, the sanctuary, which had been not very successfully altered uh, post-Vatican II uh, in, in a contemporary, but we like to think sympathetic. And Mark Bamra did a magnificent job in that east window, um, which is seven light window, about 30% of which had been lost, but was important enough to, to um, justify restoration. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the same book, Letherby tells the story of Philip Webb giving advice to a young man, Alfred Powell, who wants to become an architect. Webb wrote to him on the 17th of March, 1894, saying, it would be good fortune if you could, if you could so arrange things as to have a year's continuous work of carpentering in its various kinds. Of course, I know this might be impossible, but if so, I should say that would be a misfortune as you would be keeping your eyes wide open to all collateral things, you would pick up general knowledge of the various other crafts connected with building and would gain much more help to after your work than in any other way. Many architects have subsequently taken Webb's advice seriously and more should have done. All ideas of this kind are founded upon two mistaken suppositions. The first, that one man's thoughts can be or ought to be executed by another man's hands. The second, that manual labor is a degradation when it is governed by intellect. We are always in these days endeavoring to separate the two. We want one man to be always thinking and another to be always working. And we call one a gentleman and the other an operative. Whereas the workman ought often to be thinking and the thinker often to be working, and both should be a gentleman in the best sense. As it is, we make both ungentle, the one in vain, envying, the other despising his brother. And the mass of society is made up of morbid thinkers and miserable workers. Now it is only by labour that thought can be made healthy, and only by thought that labour can be made happy and the two cannot be separated with impunity. It would be well if all of us were good handicraftsmen in some kind, and the dishonor of manual work done away with altogether, so that though there should still be a distinction of race between nobles and a form of and commoners, there should not among the latter be a trenchant distinction of employment and more in excellence of achievement and yet more in each several profession. No master should be too proud to do its hardest work. The painter should grind his own colors. The architect work in the mason's yard with his men. The master manufacturer be himself a more skillful operative than any man in his mills. And the distinction between one man and another be only in experience and skill and the authority and wealth which these must naturally and justly obtain. The nature of Gothic gives us a fascinating insight into Ruskin's enthusiastic espousal of the Gothic style of building, which is definitely something we need to know more about to understand his way of thinking about architecture and sculpture. So we'll explore some more in Ruskin's own words. For in one point of view, Gothic is not only the best, but the only rational architecture, as being that which can fit itself, e fit itself most easily to all services, vulgar or noble, undefined in its slope of roof, height of shaft, breadth of arch, or disposition of ground plan. It can shrink into a turret, expand into a hall, coil into a staircase, or spring into a spire with undegraded grace and unexhausted energy. And whenever it finds occasion for change in its form or purpose, it submits to it without the slightest sense of loss, either to its unity or majesty, subtle 
and flexible like a fiery serpent, but ever attentive to the voice of a charmer. And it is one of the chief virtues of the Gothic builders that they never suffered ideas of outside symmetries and consistencies to interfere with the real use and value of what they did. If they wanted a window, they opened one. A room, they added one. A buttress, they built one, utterly regardless of any established conventionalities of external appearance, knowing, as indeed it always happened, that such daring interruptions of the formal plan would rather give additional interest to his symmetry than injure it. Would you like to just tell us about the building very briefly on the screen? My utter pleasure to uh, talk about the image, which is Roslyn Chapel. And uh, we're looking at the south elevation at this point. And what you can see to the right hand side of the central buttress is a new stained glass window. Uh, so another addition into the sort of honourable tradition of polychromatic glass. And um, the, the image in front of me uh, gives me nostalgia in the sense of, you can see that on the right hand side, we have, well, we can see three buttresses, three pinnacles and three finials that are top each one. And on the right hand side, you can see that um, it's the, the buttress and the, and the pinnacle and the finial are generally in good condition, they're generally unsoiled. And then the central buttress unsoiled. And then on the left hand side, you can see that the buttress remains soiled with environmental pollution products. Peter will know very well of the discussions that we had with the inspectors at that time of Historic Environment Scotland, who we were working very closely with in terms of exactly what remedial treatments we should uh, apply to individual items of defect, damage and decay. Thank you. Andreas. Yes, so that in the best times of Gothic, a useless window would rather have been opened in an unexpected place for the sake of the surprise than a useful one forbidden for the sake of symmetry. Every successive architect employed upon a, upon a great work built the pieces he added in his own way, utterly regardless of the style adopted by his predecessors. And if two towers were raised in nominal correspondence at the sides of a cathedral front, one was nearly sure to be different from the other, and in each the style at the top to be different from the style at the bottom. Towards the end of The Nature of Gothic, Ruskin gives what he refers to as some plain and practical rules for determining in every instance whether a given building be good Gothic or not. So let's just explore them for a little while. James. First, look if the roof rises in a steep gable high above the walls. If it does not do this, there is something wrong. The building is not quite pure Gothic or it has been altered. Secondly, look if the principal windows and doors have pointed arches with gables over them. If not pointed arches, the building is not Gothic. If they have not any gables over them, it is either not pure or not first rate. If, however, it has the steep roof, the pointed arch and gable all united, it is nearly certain to be a Gothic building of a very fine type. Thirdly, look if the arches are cusped or apertures foliated. If the building has met the first two conditions, it is sure to be foliated somewhere. But if not everywhere, the parts, parts which are unfoliated are imperfect. Unless they are large bearing arches or small and sharp arches in groups, forming a kind of foliation by their own multiplicity and relieved by sculpture and rich mouldings. The upper windows, for instance, in the east end of Westminster Abbey are imperfect for want of foliation. If there be no foliation anywhere, the building is assuredly imperfect Gothic. Fourthly, if the building meets all the first three conditions, look of its arches in general, whether of windows and doors or of minor ornamentation. 
are carried on true shafts with bases and capitals. If they are, then the building is truly of the finest Gothic style. It may still perhaps be an imitation, a feeble copy, or a bad example of a noble style, but the manner of it, having met all these four conditions, is assuredly first rate. If its apertures have not shafts and capitals, look if they are plain openings in the walls, studiously simple and unmoulded at the sides, as for instance the arch in plate 19. If so, the building may still be of the finest Gothic, adapted to some domestic or military service. But if the sides of the window be moulded, and yet there are no capitals at the spring of the arch, it is assuredly of an inferior school. This is all that is necessary to determine whether the building be of a fine Gothic style. <coughs> Next tests to be applied are in order to discover whether it be good architecture or not, for it may be very impure Gothic and yet very noble architecture, or it may be very pure Gothic, and yet if a copy or originally raised by an ungifted builder, very bad architecture. If it belong to any of the great schools of color, its criticism becomes as complicated and needs as much care as that of a piece of music, and no general rules for it can be given. But if not, first, see if it looks as if it had been built by strong men. If it has the sort of roughness and largeness and nonchalance mixed in places with the exquisite tenderness which seems always to be the sign manual of the broad vision and massive power of men <coughs> who can see past the work they are doing and betray here and there something like disdain for it. If the building has this character, it is much already in its favour. It will go hard, but it proves a noble one. If it has not this, but is altogether accurate, minute and scrupulous in its workmanship, it must belong to either the very best or the very worst of schools. The very best, in which exquisite design is wrought out with untiring and conscientious care, as in the Giotesque Gothic, or the very worst, in which mechanism has taken the place of design. It is more likely, in general, that it should belong to the worst than the best, so that on the whole, very accurate workmanship is to be esteemed a bad sign. And if there is nothing remarkable about the building but its precision, it may be passed at once with contempt. Secondly, observe if it be irregular, its different parts fitting themselves to different purposes, no one caring what becomes of them, so that they do their work. If one part always answers accurately to another part, it's sure to be a bad building. And the greater and more conspicuous the irregularities, the greater the change chances are that it is a good one. For instance, in the Ducal Palace, of which a rough woodcut is given in Chapter 8, the general idea is sternly symmetrical. But two windows are lower than the rest of the six. And if the reader will count the arches of the small arcade as far as to the great balcony, he will find it is not in the centre, but set to the right-hand side by the whole width of one of those arches. We may be pretty sure that the building is a good one. None but a master of his craft would have ventured to do this. Thirdly, observe if all the traceries, capitals and other ornaments are of perpetually varied design. If not, the work is assuredly bad. Lastly, read the sculpture. Preparatory to reading it, you will have to discover whether it is legible and, if legible, it is nearly certain to be worth reading. On a good building, sculpture is always so set and on such a scale that at the ordinary distance from which the edifice is seen, the sculpture should be thoroughly intelligible and interesting. In order to accomplish this, the uppermost statues will be 10 or 12 feet high, and the upper ornamentation will be colossal, increasing in fineness as it descends. 
till on the foundation it will often be wrought as if for a precious cabinet in a king's chamber. But the spectator will not notice that the upper sculptures are colossal. He will merely feel that he can see them plainly and make them out all out at his ease. And having ascertained this, let him set himself to read them. Thenceforward, the criticism of the building is to be conducted precisely on the same principles as that of a book, and it must depend on the knowledge, feeling, and not a little on the industry and perseverance of the reader, whether, even in the case of the best works, he either perceive them to be great or feel them to be entertaining. I'm sure many of you will recognize the central portion high up of the west front of Wells Cathedral in the image that we've just been looking at. By this point, we hope we may have given something of the flavor of Ruskin's ideas about the nature of Gothic and his special feeling for craftspeople and craftsmanship. This leads us neatly onto the Lamp of Memory, the sixth lamp of the Seven Lamps of Architecture, published in 1849 therefore a few years earlier than the Stones of Venice. It contains some of the most enjoyable passages of prose that Ruskin was ever to write. Discuss, you might say, but I believe so. Moreover, it lays down a foundation stone for the elaboration of conservation ethics and philosophy in directions which have had worldwide influence from that day to this. It is as the centralization and protectress of this sacred, this sacred influence that architecture is to be regard, regarded by us with the most serious thought. We may live without her and worship without her, but we cannot remember without her. How cold is all history, how lifeless all imagery compared to that which the living nation writes and the uncorrupted marble bears. How many pages of doubtful record might we not often spare for a few stones left one upon another? The ambition of the old Babel builders was well directed for this world. There are but two strong conquerors for the forgetfulness of men, poetry and architecture. And the latter <laughs> in some sort includes the former and is mightier in its reality. It is well to have not only what men have thought and felt, but what their hands have handled and their strength have wrought and their eyes beheld all the days of their life. The age of Homer is surrounded with darkness, his very personality with doubt, not so that of Pericles. And the day is coming when we shall confess that we have learned more of Greece out of the crumbled fragments of her sculpture than even from her sweet singers or soldier historians. And if indeed there be any profit in our knowledge of the past or any joy in the thought of being remembered hereafter, which can give strength to present exertion or patience to present endurance, there are two duties respecting national architecture whose importance it is impossible to overrate. The first to render the architecture of the day historical and the second to preserve as the most precious of inheritances that of past ages. Benevolent regards and purposes of men in masses seldom can be supposed to extend beyond their own generation. They may look to posterity as an audience, may hope for its attention and labor for its praise. They may trust to its recognition of unacknowledged merit and demand its justice for contemporary wrong. But all this is mere, mere selfishness and does not involve the slightest regard to or consideration of the interest of those by whose numbers we would fain swell the circle of our flatterers and by whose authority we would gladly support our presently disputed claims. The idea of self-denial for the sake of posterity of practicing present economy for the sake of debtors yet unborn, of planting forests that our descendants may live under their shade, or of raising cities for future nations to inhabit, 
never, I suppose, sufficiently takes place among publicly recognized motives of exertion. Yet these are not the less our duties, nor is our part fitly sustained upon the earth, unless the range of our intended and deliberate usefulness include not only the companions, but the successors of our pilgrimage. And then Ruskin gives one of his great teachings. God has lent us the earth for our life. It is a great entail. It belongs as much to those who are to come after us and whose names are already written in the book of creation as to us. And we have no right by anything that we do or neglect to involve them in unnecessary penalties or deprive them of benefits which it was in our power to bequeath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this the more because it is one of the appointed conditions of the labor of men that in proportion to the time between the seed sowing and the harvest is the fullness of the fruit and that generally therefore the farther off we place our aim and the less we desire to be ourselves the witnesses of what we have labored for, the more wide and rich will be the measure of our success. Men cannot benefit those that are with them as they can benefit those who come after them, and of all the pulpits from which human voice ever sent is ever sent forth, there is none from which it reaches so far as from the grave. Nor is there, indeed, any present loss in such respect for futurity. Every human action gains in honour, in grace, in all true magnificence, by its regard to things that are to come. It is the far sight, the quiet and confident patience that, above all other attributes, separate man from man or near him to his maker. And there is no action nor art whose majesty we may not measure by this test. Therefore, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for. And let us think, as we lay stone on stone, that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them and that men will say as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see, our, this our fathers did for us. For indeed, the greatest glory of a building is not in its stones, nor in its gold. Its glory is in its age. And in that deep sense of voicefulness, of stern watching, of mysterious sympathy, nay, even the even of approval or condemnation, which we feel in walls that have long been washed by the passing waves of humanity. It is in their lasting witness against men, in their quiet contrast with the transitional character of all things, in the strength which, through the lapse of seasons and times, and the decline and birth of dynasties, and the changing of the face of the earth and of the limits of the sea maintains its sculptured shapeliness for a time insuperable, connects forgotten and following ages with each other, and half constitutes the identity as it concentrates the sympathy of nations. It is in that golden stain of time that we are to look for the real light and colour and preciousness of architecture. And it is not until a building has assumed this character, till it has been entrusted with the fame and hallowed by the deeds of men, till its walls have been witnesses of suffering and its pillars rise out of the shadows of death, that its existence, more lasting as it is than that of the natural objects of the world around it, can be gifted with even so much as these possess of language and of life. Now to return to our immediate subject, it so happens that in architecture, the superinduced and accidental beauty <coughs> is most commonly inconsistent 
with the preservation of original character. And the picturesque is therefore sought in ruin and supposedly to consist in decay. Whereas even when so sought, it consists in the mere sublimity of the rents or fractures or stains or vegetation which assimilate the architecture with the work of nature and bestow upon it those circumstances of color and form which are universally beloved by the eye of man. So far as this is done to the extinction of the true characters of the architecture, it is picturesque. And the artist who looks to the stem of the ivy instead of the shaft of the pillar is carrying out in more daring freedom the debased sculptor's choice of the hair instead of the countenance. But as far as it can be rendered consistent with the inherent character, the picturesque or extraneous sublimity of architecture has just this of nobler function in it than that of any other object whatsoever that is an exponent of age, of that in which, ha as has been said, the greatest glory of the building consists, and therefore the external signs of this glory having power and purpose greater than any belonging to their mere sensible beauty, may be considered as taking rank among pure and essential characters. So essential to my mind that I think a building cannot be considered as in its prime until four or five centuries have passed over it. And that the entire choice and arrangement of its details should have reference to their appearance after that period, so that none should be admitted that would suffer material injury, either by the weather staining or the mechanical degradation which the lapse of such a period would necessitate. It does not belong to my present plan to consider at length the second head of duty of which I have above spoken, the preservation of the architecture we possess. But a few words may be forgiven as especially necessary in modern times. <clears throat> Neither by the public nor by those who have the care of public monuments is the true meaning of the word restoration understood. It means the most total destruction which a building can suffer, a destruction out of which no remnants can be gathered a destruction accompanied with false description of the thing destroyed. Do not let us deceive ourselves in this important matter. It is impossible, as impossible as to raise the dead to restore anything that has ever been great or beautiful in architecture. That which I have above insisted upon as the life of the whole, that spirit which is given only by the hand and eye of the workman, can never be recalled. Another spirit may be given by another time, and it is then a new building, but the spirit of the dead workman cannot be summoned up and commanded to direct other hands and other thoughts. And as for direct and simple copying, it is palpably impossible. What copying can there be of surfaces that have been worn half an inch down? The whole finish of the work was in the half inch that is gone. If you attempt to restore that finish, you do it conjecturally. If you copy what is left, granting fidelity to be possible, and what care or watchfulness or cost can secure it, how is the new work better than the old? There was yet in the old some life, some mysterious suggestion of what it had been and of what it had lost some sweetness in the gentle lines which rain and sun had wrought. There can be none in the brute hardness of the new carving. The first step to restoration, I have seen it, and that again and again, seen it in the Baptistry of Pisa, seen it in the Casa d'Oro in Venice, seen it in the Cathedral of Lisieux, is to dash the old work to pieces. The second, is usually to put up the cheapest and basest imitation which can escape detection. But in all cases, however careful and however laboured, an imitation still, 
a cold model of such parts as can be modeled with conjectural supplements. And my experience has as yet furnished me with only one instance, that of the Palais de Justice at Rouen, in which even this, the utmost degree of fidelity which is possible, has been attained or even attempted. Do not let us talk then of restoration. The thing is alive from beginning to end. You may make a model of a building as you may of a corpse, and your model may have the shell of the old walls within it, as your cast might have the skeleton. With what advantage I neither see nor care, but the old building is destroyed, and that more totally and mercilessly than if it had sunk into a deep of, a heap of dust or melted into a mass of clay. More has been gleaned out of desolated Nineveh than ever will be out of rebuilt Milan. But it is said that there may come a necessity for restoration. Granted, look the necessity full in the face and understand it on its own terms. It is a, ne is a necessity for destruction, accepted as such. Pull the building down, throw its stones into neglected corners, make ballast of them, or mortar if you will, but do it honestly, and do not set up a lie in their place, and look that necessity in the face before it comes, and you may prevent it. Take proper care of your monuments, and you will not need to restore them. A few sheets of lead put in time upon a roof, a few dead leaves and sticks swept in time out of a watercourse will save both roof and walls from ruin. Watch an old building with an anxious care, guard it as best you may, and at any cost from every influence of dilapidation. Count its stones as you would jewels of a crown. Set watches about it as if at the gates of a besieged city. Bind it together with iron where it loosens, Stay it with timber where it declines. Do not care about the unsightliness of the aid. Better a crutch than a lost limb. And do this tenderly and reverently and continually. And many a generation will still be born and pass away beneath its shadow. Its evil day must come at last, but let it come declaredly and openly. And let no dishonoring and false substitute deprive it of the funeral offices of memory. We began this session with a quotation from William Morris, and we shall end with another, namely the manifesto which William Morris and Philip Webb put together to be the foundation document for the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, the SBAB, in 1877. I've held in my hand a brief letter from Ruskin, which survives in the SBAB archives, giving specific permission for Morris and Webb to use as much as they wanted of the sentiments in the lamp of memory. And I've invited Rory, Rory Young, an artificer and sculptor of renown, to read the manifesto because it seems to me that the whole of his professional life has been a kind of dialogue with the text of the manifesto. What is a manifesto? It surely is intended to be a persuasive document, a trumpet blast, if you will, but it is not a specification. That comes out of the judgment and experience of the artist, craftsman, or artificer. And I just draw attention to the fact that on the screen we have a wonderful photograph of details of the Great West Doorway of York Minster as reimagined by Rory around about the year 2000. And I was lucky enough to be living and working in York at that time and so often visited the workshop while the work of carving was going on. And equally was several times staying with Rory when he was working on the models. I'll never forget his excitement one day arriving and he saying to me, I found Adam, and because he had a knack of seeing in the faces of people in the streets of Sirencester, exactly the qualities that he wanted for specific figures in this great work, as I believe it to be. 
Rory, it's such a joy to have you read this manifesto to us this evening. Thank you. No doubt, within the last 50 years, a new interest, almost like another sense, has arisen in these ancient monuments of art. And they have become the subject of one of the most interesting of studies and of, in, of, and of an enthusiasm, religious, historical, artistic, which is one of the undoubted gains of our time. Yet we think that if the present treatment of them be continued, our descendants will find them useless for study and chilling to enthusiasm. We think that those last 50 years of knowledge and attention have done more for their destruction than all the foregoing centuries of revolution, violence and contempt. For architecture, long decaying, died out, as a popular art at least, just as the knowledge of medieval art was born so that the civilized world of the 19th century has no style of its own amidst the wide knowledge of the styles of other centuries. From this lack and this gain arose in men's minds the strange idea of the restoration of ancient buildings. And a strange and most fatal idea which by its very name implies that it is possible to strip from a building, this, that, and the other part of its history, of its life, that is, and then to say, and then to stay the hand at some arbitrary point and leave it still historical, living, and even as it once was. In early times, this kind of forgery was impossible because knowledge failed the builders, or but or perhaps because instinct held them back. If repairs were needed, if ambition or piety pricked on to change, that change, change was of necessity wrought in the unmistakable fashion of the time. A church of the 11th century might be added to or altered in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th or even 17th or 18th centuries. But every change, whatever history it destroyed, left history in the gap and was alive with the spirit of the deeds done midst its fashioning. The result of all this was often a building in which the many changes, though harsh and visible enough, were by their very contrast interesting and instructive, and could by no possibility mislead. But those who make the changes wrought in our day under the name of restoration, while professing to bring back a building to the best time of its history, have no guide, but each to his own individual whim to point out to them what is admirable and what is contemptible while the very nature of their tasks compels them to destroy something and to supply the gap by imagining what the earlier builders should or might have done. Moreover, in the course of this double process of destruction and addition, the whole surface of the building is necessarily tampered with, so that the appearance of antiquity is taken away from such old parts of the fabric as are left, and there is no laying to rest in the spectator the, dis, the suspicion of what may have been lost, and in short, a feeble and lifeless forgery is the final result of all the wasted labour. It is sad to say that in this manner, most of the bigger minsters and a vast number of more humble buildings, both in England and on the continent have been dealt with by men of talent often, but worthy of better employment, but deaf to the claims of poetry and history in the highest sense of the words. For what is left, we plead therefore, our architects themselves before the official guardians of buildings, 
and before the public generally. And we pray them to remember how much is gone of the religion, thought and manners of time past. Never by almost universal consent to be restored and to consider whether it be possible to restore those buildings. The living spirit of which it cannot be too often repeated was an inseparable part of that religion and thought of those past manners. For our part, we assure them fearlessly that of all the restorations yet undertaken, the worst have meant the reckless stripping of a building of some of its most important and most interesting material features, while the best have their exact analogy in the restoration of an old picture where the partly perished work of the ancient craftsmaster has been made neat and smooth by the tricky hand of some unoriginal and thoughtless hack of today. If, for the rest, it be asked us to specify what kind of amount of art, style, or other interest in the building makes it worth protecting, we answer anything which can be looked on as artistic, picturesque, historical, antique, or substantial. Any work, in short, over which educated artistic people would think it worthwhile to argue at all. It is for all these buildings, therefore, of all times and styles, that we plead and, co and call upon those who have to deal with them, to put protection in the way of restoration, to stave off decay by daily care, to prop a perilous wall or mend a leaky roof by such means as are obviously meant for support or covering, and show no pretense of other art, and like otherwise to resist all that has become inconvenient for its present sorry, otherwise to resist all tempering, tampering with either the fabric or ornament of the building as it stands. If it has become inconvenient for its present use to raise another building rather than alter or enlarge the old one. In fine, to treat our ancient buildings as monuments of a bygone art created by bygone manners that modern art cannot meddle with without destroying. Thus, and thus only, shall we escape the reproach of our learning being turned into a snare to us. Thus, and thus only, can we protect our ancient buildings and hand them down instructive and venerable to those who come after us. Wow. Trumpet blast indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Rory, very much. I, I know you've been pondering the manifesto a good deal in preparation for this evening. Yes. But what was I fair in saying that your professional life has been a kind of dialogue with a text, this particular text? It's and been an agony. Uh, agony. <laughs> this is what I spoke about when I received the Isha Award at the SPAB. And I really felt, I still feel um, it should have gone to somebody else. I just feel completely undeserving of it because um, some of my friends accused me of a restorer. And the Great West Door was an example of that. And Giles Worsley wrote the most marvellous piece uh, in the Telegraph about how I wrestled with, you know, because I was very much in the SBAB camp, not to touch the medieval work, uh, exactly as Ruskin or Rodin would, would, would advocate. And I found myself being pushed into a competition and then winning it. And the whole thing, the whole thing had developed, got, got momentum. There was no way that the Dean and Chapter were going to be stopped in um, renewing the Genesis cycle. And um, so one felt one had to, um, you know, one was utter, one felt the weight of responsibility on one's shoulders and that we had to do it very well. The world was looking to us to get it right. This is what I wrote to the Dean about, to get the best stone and to encourage the carvers. And one thing I wrote very recently, actually, um, the lecture I gave to the 
Princess Foundation students, young students, uh, with I was bursting into tears as I read it. Um, that I wrote a letter which I never used. Uh, it's just written in red bar in the file, and I found it just recently when I was preparing this lecture. And it's a plea to the dean to let uh, the carvers um, have me there as they wished uh, to um, encourage them to so that we could really push. And I remember you talked about the artistic tension in the figures. And I believe that could have been got further. Uh, it should have been pushed further. We needed just that more time, that unquantifiable time that Ruskin talks about in making art, which is so different from the production line. Um, you know, in the lower orders, the Sawyers and Masons might be on the production line as evolved through the 19th century, but the carvers, you know, they are doing something else. They are finding meaningful form in those last few millimeters of stone. And I hadn't found that in my models. And of course, there, there is another terrible thing that I was, you know, Gill and people going back to Ruskin and back to Michelangelo, there's a school that feels that model making is, is a very bad thing. So in order to make the final result, you make a model and then you work from it. I mean, where is the artwork? It's actually a lot in the model, but it's a lot in the final interpretation of the model into the stone. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a stage one and stage two process, really. It's a, it's a continuum of creativity. Um, I could ramble on, but it was a very nerve wracking project. And the only thing I can say now is that for years, they looked like a bar of white soap. They looked soapy and, and sort of um, just not crisp as medieval work. I love that word Ruskin uses of, um, what does he talk about? Um, toughness, a sort of toughness um, of the whole building and yet very fine detail, beautifully sort of modulated. And um, finally, the weather has done what I hoped could have, been, could have been got in the workshops in that it has shaded the form of the figures and it's made the form stick out and um, well it's given it's sort of adumbrated them it's shadowed them uh, and um, you know by, by pollution by, by atmospheric dirt the the action of condensation on the stone with dirt particles in it sticking to the stone and so they've now got this sort of lovely uh, the beginning to get that well it's not a golden pattern of time but it's actually a sort of um, a warm gray uh, to start with, they were white and alien to the building, and now you feel the building is starting to claim claim it to themselves. But I'm not going to stick up for it because there are still people I know who turn their face away from the project, thinking it was a desecration. Because of course, medieval buildings, medieval stones were removed. But I felt when we went to Thailand, Peter, that was the moment when we discovered, we learnt that a Buddhist temple is meaningless when it is not up and running as a religious building. That's what made me realize that perhaps cathedrals are an exception to our med medieval building stock in that they do need to speak out and great ones like York Minster with its Archbishop of York. Um, the, 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 that Genesis cycle was a prayer in stone and it's performing, so one, its function had been lost to it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's this argument that I have that I talked about at the Isha Award is I believe so much and I try and keep as much fabric as possible, ancient fabric, even though it's melting into a sort of soft, these soft lines that Ruskin talks about, um, soft curvaceous lines. But I just think we have a responsibility to preserve the meaning of a building and to, mm. um, well, add another layer of interest and beauty of our times. And of course, this is where I differ from a uh, sort of extreme SPAB view in that um, I think we can do it in a very subtle way where perhaps only the experts will notice the difference in workmanship and stone because you can never get the same stone again. Um, the technology changes in every generation. And I love reading buildings and seeing, you can tell every generation of work has been added, even though it pulls together as a whole. So there are, you can go round and round in circles with these arguments. I didn't have time to explain to you, but I hope you enjoyed the fact that we showed two 
images of Inglesham Church in yes. while you Wonderful. were speaking. Yes. Because I knew you loved Inglesham and I love it. all know that William Morris loved it dearly too. Yes. And that is a building where you can literally read from the 12th century onwards yes. in the architecture, can't you? And yes. The reality of it, the authenticity of it. Yes, absolutely. I and three friends walked the upper reaches of the Thames. In fact, where my father was born, down to where my mother was born at Ledgeshade. And we walked past Inglesham, and I'd never done that walk before. It was amazing. So I was encompassing my whole childhood, my sort of incunabula, you could say. And that church, which I didn't know in my youth, uh, but in fact, my grandfather was born at Inglesham Farmhouse. I think it's called College Farm Inglesham, right beside yes. the church. Yes, wow. Yeah. Well. I want to, in case I don't get a chance later, I want to express a warm thank you to all the speakers and to say that together, I feel we've le begun to learn such a lot about Ruskin. And I remember, R Rory, when you came to the first of the two read-throughs, you said, I've been meaning to read Ruskin all my life, <laughs> and now I am. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. And I've so often come across people for whom he is an important name, but they perhaps never really read anything more than quotations. And so one of the purposes of this series of readings is to give us an opportunity to read Ruskin together in a small group, which we have been mindfully, thoughtfully, slowly questioning it a bit because there is a lot of ambiguity in Ruskin and we mustn't erect him as a prophet. Uh, and I think one thing he would have been surprised to find um, nowadays is that we have a system which at its best works really well, that good architects like James uh, and Andreas are inspecting churches and other old buildings regularly, and that from that flows a programme of careful work. And I think, you know, done with understanding, that system works so well, and so we haven't got the kind of do or die restorations of the 19th century happening so often. And where they do happen, it's often perhaps because there's too much money rather than too little money. Mm. But there are many factors, of course. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm sure there will be comments. Yes, I think there are 18 in the chat. And Simon, will you take us into them, please? We're, we're <coughs> wanting to know what people thought. And if they feel the experiment of a reading like this is worthwhile. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you all. Um, I do encourage you. Uh, it's the the um, chat is essentially the most wonderful um, contribution by Timothy Meek, uh, who I imagine some of you know, um, mm. who uh, comes in both fists forward. I think it's fair to say, uh, but in a wonderfully creative and and engaging way. But sort of working backwards, um, he references the Nara Charter. And uh, his last comment on the subject is, the NARA document asks us to consider other non-Western, brackets, white values, values that celebrate renewal. Wells, Glendinning and Emmerich all reevaluate where we are in world conservation. And Emmerich asks a fundamental question. Is it time to free ourselves from the tyranny of Ruskin and Morris? So I thought that was the most com combative statement in the chat and that any of you might want to respond to it. Any of you um, readers this evening might be interested in responding to it in whatever fame, where you like. Oh. Nick, what do you make of that? Brilliant. Um, what I know of the Narrow Charter is that it speaks about authenticity and, and understanding original construction. Um, but it, and the Nara Charter was formed in Japan. So there are sort of two aspects to that that I'll quickly run through. That is that as within my role as an international consultant, uh, I've been very fortunate enough to, walk, to work in India and China and understand that there are massive and distinct cultural differences to how we each look after our historic structures. Peter and Rory spoke about their experience in Thailand and my experience in India is, is absolutely the same. So our, our view of authenticity is very different from our international colleagues, for example. But uh, is it time to wean ourselves from Ruskin and Morris? I, I don't think so. I think there's so much to 
here in the words that we read this evening. For example, this rant against restoration speaks eloquently about the benefits of maintenance. And mm. that has that's a very strong SPAB message and it's yes. a very strong practical message. And it speaks eloquently about the value of historic structures in terms of latent energy, which speaks eloquently itself about climate emergency. So were it not for these words, we wouldn't be speaking about this now. I feel we need Ruskin to inspire us, but it's important to remember, as I think I said, that he's not writing a specification for work, but I think we need both the prose and the poetry of conservation. We need to be inspired. Mm -hmm. And, and to be reminded of the values that we share. Uh, but at the same time, the how-to is something different and compromises sometimes have to be made and sometimes the compromises can be very creative. Like that example you showed us in some images in the last day or two, James, for example. But uh, what I think is needful <laughs> is that we move beyond the the, the narrowness of being white Anglo-Saxons and you know have a more generous feeling for the other cultures of the world. And this is a problem with Ruskin is that he, he, he was writing in a particular context at a particular time. So we must not take him with a pinch of salt exactly, but let, let him do what he can do for us, just as other writers and theorists can do what they can do for us. James, what do you think? Oh, well, I, I just, I think it's the poetry for me in, in Ruskin, I just, I mean, walls worn with the passing waves of humanity. You know, that's, mm. that's when, you know, when you walk into Dubrovnik and you see the, you know, the, the paving, you know, when you walk into the city, the walled city, and you just see this, you know, that wonderful limestone just polished with mm. the passing waves of people's feet. And that, those are the, the for me, you know the, the the most exciting aspects of of old um, of old buildings and um, so I but I, I must admit Tim I'm, I'm not familiar with that charter I'm ashamed to say oh my. I'll be reading it I'll be reading it very soon and um, yes. and I, I think debate's good and and you know questioning and you know even things that you believe in you know if something's that good it's robust enough to to be allowed to be questioned and. A great friend of many of us here, James Simpson, I remember him once shocking me by saying, you know, even pastiche can be good if it's done well. I think, I don't think he was advocating pastiche in any way, but just saying, you know, if anything's done well, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, 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 it has some merits. And um, he was probably being controversial then as well. But, uh, Thank you. So Rory, do you want to come in on this? Um, no, I, have, I had a thought, but um, no, I'll, I'll pass on this one. Uh, uh, um, well, yes, a, a wonderful thing that um, when we were doing the um, the statue of the the Queen on the uh, Queen Elizabeth on the Great West Door, uh, sorry, on the west front of York Minster, just to the right of the Great West Door, um, I was on the committee to sort of um, get get the design working and this extraordinary wide niche, which was for an equestrian statue. There's a row of four of them on the big major buttresses on the West Front. And um, uh, Oliver produced in his um, sort of um, um, his piece to the CFCE, um, a, a wonderful piece by his, um, written by his father, um, no, written by his grandfather about W.D. Carrow. Mm. And he's absolutely marvellous in saying the difference between creativity with one, with one foot in the past, you know, not being afraid to borrow from the past, and yet never being pastiche. It's absolutely brilliant. And I, you know, that this was, you know, there was W.D. Carrow, all those architects of that period, you know, think of Weir Schultz, they all drew in sketchbooks, they looked at buildings, they were really conversant with them, and, and they synthesized that. It went into their souls, and so they were able to recreate without copying parrot fashion. And I think that's the difference between um, working in a great tradition, and I believe you still can, we can still do it now, uh, and, and, and that's the difference between that and pastiche. Thank you. 
um, all slavish copying or or just bad copying. You know, I mean, just there's so much bad copying in, amongst the in the masonry trade, um, and, and and architects who have no idea of of the orders or 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 you know they've never looked they've, because they've never kept a sketchbook. They've never had that schooling right from that observation. Drawing is so important, isn't it? And R Ruskin's book of instruction on drawing, I believe, has never been out of print, and we should encourage greater use of it. Mm. Andreas, do you have a comment? How have you found your, your first encounter with Ruskin? You're muted, Andreas. Muted. You're still muted, Andreas? No, it's better. Yeah. Mm. No, I'm I'm very impressed because, yeah, I've been working for eight years with Thomas Will and um, uh, Professor Lippert at the University of Dresden, and of course I, I came across of a lot of uh, little pieces of of what we read today, but it's very beautiful to see the overall image, and also I think that in for me 2022 is a year of change, and so and we are looking into many different and new themes. And I'm I'm taking along some of these thoughts, how to how to create the near future and how to to um, deal with old buildings and with stone buildings, and so I I wrote a comment because I was in in um, February this year I had a possibility to stay for one week in Genova, and that's uh, a city which is maybe which is showing a lot of history of very old buildings lived in by men since centuries, very dense, and in some way it's also an, a, a good example for a city in the future, in, in, a, in a hot future, and in a hot future without cars. So I think there are many possibilities to apply uh, Ruskin's thoughts onto actual um, uh, what's it, uh, challenges. Thank you. Simon, what else have you got for us that we have time for? Um, there are really, um, it is uh, Timothy, many, many thoughts he has um, in the chat. Um, and one or two other people um, uh, have left comments. Um, much earlier, Kate Mason, representing the Society of Design Across, and that she's a chair of, made the point that she notices how frequently makers, uh, cross people, uh, thrill at inheriting tools. That are really well used, much used, and that they sort of bear to use us that reference much earlier on. Um, she wanted to make that point. She's had to leave um, leave the meeting now. I'm very aware it's coming up to 7:30, and we promised we would conclude on time. Uh, Peter, is there anything you want to say before I just end with a bit of housekeeping? I I want to ask if we will we be able to save. To the remarks of Tim and others. Yes. We'll discuss them later yes. with him and with others indeed. And we want to yeah. carry the spirit of the evening onwards and not just regard it as a closed event. And the yeah. other thing I'd like to say is that, as you know, and some others know who are here, we are very much minded in the Guild to encourage the setting up of local or regional groups. And one of the things we hope they would do would be to read Ruskin together as we've been doing this evening. So I just wanted to throw that pebble in the pool uh, because you know any, anyone can set up such a group, but we have found it very rewarding and we want to carry that forward. And we've got the second one in January and so on and so forth. But um, uh, over to you for, to bring us to a conclusion. Okay, thank you so much. So can I, on behalf of the Guild and indeed our entire audience, thank you, Peter and uh, James, Andreas, Rory and Nick um, for presenting such a rich Ruskinian dialogue to begin the series. Um, it is, I always feel, very easy to start to feel a little drunk on the beauty and the poetry of Ruskin's prose, which a number of you have referred to today. And I do feel appropriately lightheaded. So I'm very grateful to all of you for that. It's an incredible luxury to be read to. Uh, I'm thinking back to childhood as being the last time probably <laughs> I had that direct experience. So thank you all very much.